start without him. Sue and Royce, you guys are at home today, huh? We worked a lot today, Calvin. I see. <laughs> Do what? Oh, Sue, uh, Chip wants you to talk a little more to get the volume right. Keep talking. Oh, okay. We, uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't do anything fun when we were shopping. We just got basic foods, you know, stuff we needed. So it wasn't anything fun. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, that helps. Thank you. you. Want me to, do you want me to sing? I sing like Brian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't let her sing. No. <laughs> row, row, row. You wrote. <laughs> she would have she would have no telling what she would have added to our 630 conversation okay guys well, it's seven o'clock so uh we're going to go ahead and and pray and then uh and then dive in lord thank you for giving us all this technology where we can meet in person and still meet online and include everyone in lord thank you for what you provided uh, thank you for the fact that we don't even know who all is joining us online. Oops, that was me playing with the microphone, sorry. Um, <laughs> the technology that I need to keep my hands off of. Uh, no, Lord, we just, we thank you for the opportunity you've given us, and we just ask that everything we do um, is, is something that glorifies you and that, that you use to spread your word uh, wherever you want it to go. Please bless our time together tonight and uh, help us understand exactly what we need to take away um, to apply to our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm always fiddling with the headset thing here. One of these days we'll get a new one of those. All right, so um, I want to run through the schedule real quick. Slight change from what I told you last week. Uh, basically, um, we've got some things going on, um, just some personal things, some travel and different things. And so April, we're still going to continue to meet, um, except for April 14th, but we're not going to be having deep study on the 7th and the 21st. We've got worship night on March 31st, and then we're going to be doing some planning for the prophecy night. Uh, those of you who are willing to help, um, I want you there to be looking at kind of involved in the planning, and then we're also going to be talking some preparedness I was hoping that Megan Wygant would be able to come and, and give us some information. She's not available on those dates. She will definitely be there on the, for the prophecy night to help out with that. Um, but uh, I, I would like some help from you guys. So come other than April 14th. So we've got March 31st. We've got the worship night. It's basically a free concert with food trucks. It'll be really encouraging, really awesome. Um, and then the 7th and the 21st, getting together at 6.30, bring your own food. We're going to have fellowship. We're going to talk about stuff. Um, and just all of us get on the same page of where we're going with this stuff and get excited about it. Carrie? Um, so we will, we will have Facebook Live on March 31st and May 5th. We will not have Zoom on those on those nights only facebook live for worship and for the prophecy night um, as far as the planning stuff goes i'd be happy to have zoom up for that we could have zoom up so that anyone who isn't a part of it can can come and join us for that um, sue seely i want you there for sure and larry i want you there for sure for, because you guys have been helping me with the the planning stuff anyone else who's willing to help out come but either way you're going to learn stuff so it, it'd be really great if you guys could come um, and then April 28th uh, by the by then I'll have the prophecy night prepared the other reason I'm trying to rush and get even though the prophecy night isn't until May 5th the reason that I need to have everything done right away is because April 11th um, I'm going to be going on the radio with Debbie 
and we're going to be advertising the prophecy night. And when she starts asking me a bunch of questions about what it is, it's not going to be good if I don't have it all locked in and put together. So that's why I need to really devote some time to it. Plus, we need to get flyers out. We need to advertise because we're hoping this is an outreach opportunity. So we want you all to be able to utilize this to invite the people that won't come to a class, but they'd come to one night to get all their questions answered about prophecy. That's, that's the thought. That's the goal. Um, so May 5th, Prophecy Night. Uh, I, if this changes, I'll let you know. I'll send this out in email. Um, then May, let's see, April 28th, but then I'll have the Prophecy Night all locked away, and we're going to dive into Psalm 83. Um, that's going to be very much like Isaiah 17. It's about a, a war, and we want to know about it. This stuff about Isaiah 17, it's really relevant, super, super relevant, with all this going on with Damascus, well, Psalm 83 is all those little nations surrounding Israel that want to attack Israel. That's real relevant too, okay? Um, so we'll finish uh, Isaiah 17 tonight. Then we're going to really ramp up and prepare big time for this prophecy night. Then we're going to go right into Psalm 83. When we get done with that, um, we will do Joel and Zechariah. Probably finish about the fall for that, just depending on how fast. Well, we might not. It might take us a little longer. But then we will finish our three-year intense going through all the books of Bible prophecy. And then we're just going to go New Testament book, Old Testament book, and just go back and forth. After we get done with Joel and Zechariah, we're going to do First and Second Timothy. And then I don't know what we're going to do next. We'll do an Old Testament book, and we'll just slide back and forth. Questions? Does this sound good? What do you guys think about this? Um, because it can't just be me. You all have to be excited and feel like we're going in the right direction too. I f the only reason I feel like this is the right direction is because God's just bugging me to death about it. And uh, that's how I, it's, I don't know if that's bad, it shows a, a bad behavior on my part, but when it's something I don't want to do, but it's constantly on my mind, on my mind, on my mind, on my mind, and I know it's something that, spreads God's word and glorifies him, you know, I kind of know where it is. So that's the way I feel about this, about this prophecy night thing, okay? All right, so let's get right on, and um, do I have the right slide up, Carrie? That one, yes. So now we're going to put up slide number three, and I just want to do a quick review um, from last week of what we talked about before we launch into the rest of it. So we went through uh, Isaiah 17 verses 1 through 3 last week and we learned about the prophet Isaiah because we can't jump into the middle of a book of 66 chapters and not have a clue of who the author is. So Isaiah is the author and he was a prophet and he was a prophet for 59 years. And that amazes me. I'll just be real honest with you. I am 59 years old. I'm about to be 60 years old, but I'm 59 years old. And when I see that he was a prophet for 59 years, I think, wow, that is a long time to be a prophet. I mean, that's a, that's a long time. That's amazing to me. He was a prophet to who? Who was he a prophet to? Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom. Which one? Southern Kingdom. He was a prophet to the Southern Kingdom based in Jerusalem. And so the Kingdom of Judah, the Southern Kingdom, that's who he was a prophet to. Um, and, and so he wrote the first half of this book. It was thought that's around 700 BC. There's some disagreements on it, but most scholars say, yeah, probably 700 BC based on what he's writing and what he's not writing. So um, the first part of the book, 700 BC, which puts the, the time frame of when this chapter, Isaiah 17, was written as 700 BC. Okay, so then last week, let's look at slide four, we covered these first three chapters, and that's the bulk, the bulk, the most important part. And so what we learned about that, the key part that we learned is that it said Damascus would be removed from being a city and would become a fallen ruin. Same thing that we're basically told in Jeremiah 49, verses 23 through 27, that there's a, a prophecy about the destruction of Damascus, okay? And so approximately 30 years before Isaiah wrote this, 732 BC, um, the Assyrian king Tigler Pileser III, he comes and he captures Damascus. But... 
He didn't destroy it. It didn't cease from being a city. It didn't become this ruin where only animals were walking around. It still remained to be a city. So it's, it's scholars, biblical scholars are divided. Some say, oh, that's already been fulfilled. But that one little piece, that important piece, that it didn't, it didn't, uh, wasn't removed from being a city and become a fallen ruin, that was not fulfilled in 732 BC. It was also attacked many times over history, but it did not cease to be a city. So it's looked by many that it's still future. Now, personally, I believe when God fulfills prophecy, he fulfills the prophecy. So if it didn't stop from being a city, I don't think it's, re I don't think it's been fulfilled yet. I think it's still a future prophecy. Well, that's super relevant to today. To today. Why? Why is it so relevant to today? What's happening right now with Damascus? Israel is hitting Damascus like crazy. And the reason Israel is hitting Damascus is because you've got Iran bringing in cargo ships full of military equipment, military personnel, and then they're taking this equipment, these bombs, these UAVs, these suicide drones, and they're shipping them out to Hamas and to Hezbollah, which is then turning around and attacking Israel. It's all coming from Damascus. So what happens? Israel keeps bombing these weapon sites, these weapon depots, these military installations in Damascus. Okay. Now, the other thing that's really, really important, we mentioned this last week, is that Muslim imams in the, syn uh, not the synagogues, in the mosque are telling their people that by July 8th, it's three months from now, by July 8th, Israel's going to be destroyed. So you've got Muslim imams saying this. What do you think that means Israel's going to do? If, if Iran is going to be destroying Israel by July 8th, that means Israel needs to defend themselves and attack whoever's going to be destroying them. Well, guess what? Damascus is the launching pad. That's not the only place because Iran now has the ability to hit Israel from further away, but Damascus is a very convenient launching pad. So this is so, I mean, what we're studying right now is super critical for these next couple months. And if we didn't get this, we wouldn't understand why it's so important. This could be the spark that ignites Gog Magog. This could be the spark that ignites all kinds of things. So we really want to get this, right? So, we, so that's what we got last week. Um, but we also want to see what else, um, what else is coming with Damascus. What does the rest of Isaiah 17 say? And how does that play in to this kind of ticking um, time bomb that we're, we're watching about to play out. And of course, we also have to know things that go on on the other side of the world, they affect us a whole lot, don't they? I mean, oh, okay, that's Ukraine. Oh, no, no, that affects us tremendously. We need to know this stuff, okay? So let's, uh, with that, anybody have any questions? We're going to dive into what we didn't study. That's just our review. Okay, so let's look at verses four through six. And it says, now in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade and the fatness of his flesh will become lean. It will be even like the reaper gathering the standing grain as his arms harvest the ears. Or it will be like one gleaning ears of grain in the valley of Raphaim. Yet gleanings will be left uh, in, in it like the shaking of an olive tree. Two or three olives on the topmost bow, four or five on the branches of a fruitful tree, declares the Lord, the God of Israel. Okay. So when, so when is this talking about? Verse 4 begins with, in that day. So what day? What day is this talking about? In that day. Okay. And Sue's answered the question because she's looked at the context. But something I want to point out is when, it, when we start in verse 4, and verse 4 says, now in that day, you have to ask the question, when? Which, which day? And the only way she knows this, the only way we can figure that out, I'm going on to slide six, is we go back to verses one through three, which is talking about the destruction of Damascus. 
okay? And blah, 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 here's the destruction of Damascus. And then verse 4 says, now in that day, which confirms exactly what Sue just said. Now in that day. It's hooked to the last three verses that we're talking about the destruction of Damascus. So now we can look at verses 4 through 6, slide slide 7, Carrie, and then uh, see what the time frame is. Now, the commentaries that say that Damascus has already been destroyed, what do you think they say about this passage? This already happened too, right? Because it was in that day. And so then the commentaries that say that Damascus hasn't been destroyed yet, what are they going to say about this passage? Hasn't happened yet. Guess where I sit? <laughs> I don't think this has happened yet. Okay, now has this area seen stuff? Yeah, yeah, it's seen stuff. But as far as this prophecy, if this prophecy is linked to Damascus and Damascus hasn't been destroyed yet, then this is still future. Then this is still coming. So then we want to we want to kind of dive in and understand um, what exactly this is saying. So first of all, notice it says in verse four. Now in that day, the glory of Jacob will fade. What's the glory of Jacob? First of all, what's Jacob? What is it talking about with Jacob? Israel. It's talking about the kingdom of Israel, the the upper kingdom of Israel, kingdom of Judah, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. It's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel when it says Jacob. Could be either one. It's confusing when it does that. But so it's talking about the northern kingdom and says the glory of Jacob will fade. What does that mean? The glory of Jacob will fade. Ah. Yeah, the power, whatever the whatever the greatness that they it was was going to fade, and what does that really say? Okay, it it their their glory wasn't God, was it? Their glory was was the man made strength that they perceived that they had, and that was going to fade, or that is going to fade. Um, now. What exactly is Isaiah saying you think is going to happen? Is he talking here about Damascus? I, I mean, is he talking here about famine when he says, uh, look how he describes it in verses 4 and 5, the fat of one's body wasting away, barren appearance of a field and of olive tree after harvest. What is he really talking about here? Is he talking about famine? It looks like he's talking about famine. I think he's talking about people getting, not just, not just famine, but the people. This is talking about the, when it's talking about a few will be left, this is talking about the people. But as we look at this description, Valley of Raphaim, why does he mention Valley of Raphaim? Did anybody look that up to see where that is, what the significance of that is? Whenever something's mentioned, we want to kind of look it up to say, okay, I don't know what the significance of this is. So, so what is it? So the Valley of Raphaim is a fertile, or was at this time, a fertile area west of Jerusalem. Extremely fertile area. And so as they're talking about stripping it clean, that would have given a very vivid picture because they wouldn't have been able to imagine the Valley of Raphaim being stripped clean. That would, and remember, in Israel, there are, Jews are always painting pictures, so it's word pictures. So that would have given a very clear work picture of not going to be good, not going to be good. Now, it's also interesting because the whole process of gleaning in the Old Testament, God actually told them not to take everything. They weren't supposed to take all of the wheat. They weren't supposed to take all of the grapes. It was like their food pantry, their, their, uh, their welfare system for the poor. They were supposed to leave it for the poor. And in this case, there's not really anything being left. There's very little that's going to be left. But this isn't a prophecy about, about famine. This is a prophecy about doom on northern Israel. So that's interesting because we know with Ezekiel Gog Magog, as all these hordes come in, what's going to happen? As the hordes come in, it God's going to save them. We learned that, right? Well, this is talking about doom. So this is not related. It might be in the same time frame. One might kick off another, or it might be a separate time frame, because we don't know the time frame for either one here. 
but the doom, I'm wondering, I mean, this could even t- be talking about a second, the second seal of the tribulation. We don't really know the time frame of this, but we know it's hooked to the destruction of Damascus. So that's, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Just a piece of the puzzle with Damascus is going to be not good for northern Israel either. Now, with that understanding, what's the implication of verse 6? Um, yet gleamings will be left. This is the reason I think it's talking about people, not just famine. Gleamings will be left. God always leaves a remnant of his people. He never cleans them all out. There's always a remnant left. So even though the northern kingdom is going to be attacked, there's going to be a remnant left. So I find that kind of interesting too. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay, so Sue just said something really important. So she's, she's comparing this to, um, with Ezekiel, we saw God uh, uh, re-fertilizing the land, making everything grow again before he brought the people back. Now the people are there, and things are going to be wiped out. It's just the opposite. Why? What would cause that? Well, he's getting their attention. He's trying to get them to come back to him. So that's very important to know also when we think about what the goal is. Cheryl, did you have something? That's a good question. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know if that will be the believer's that are, what do you think, Fred? Oh, (laughs) he's moving on. Forget it, Cheryl. Fred's moving on. (laughs) Yeah, so um, Cheryl said, is it possible that the gleanings that are left are the believers, are those who believe? And that's a good thought, but I don't know. I don't know if it tells us that here, because sometimes the remnant that he leaves isn't believers yet, and they become believers later. Fred, what's your thought? I'm thinking that if it's the harvest, or those that are harvested, or gathered into one, would you be believers? Okay. So you were going with the direction she was going. No, I had a question about Jacob. Why does it have to be the northern kingdom? Northern kingdom? Why, is it, why does it have to be the northern tribes? Good question. A good question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're, that is true. Yeah. At this time, I mean, I was I was looking at it from this time standpoint. It would have pointed to the northern kingdom. But you're right. You're right. At the if it's a future time frame. Would it be the northern kingdom? I made that assumption that it would still be the same. But if it's future, I don't know. That's a really good point. Yeah? Yeah? I still lean towards the northern, but I don't know. That, that leaves a question mark because it doesn't... I don't know if that's enough that we could really say that for sure. That's a really good point. Any other thoughts? Okay, so... Um, let's go on if we don't have any other thoughts to uh, slide 8 verses 7 and 8 and it says in that day man will have regard for his maker and his eyes will look to the holy one of Israel he will not have regard for the altars the works of his hands 
nor will he look to that which his fingers have made, even the ashram and incense stands. Okay, who's the ashram? Do we still have ashram today? <laughs> Sue's always jumping like three pages ahead on my notes. <laughs> I agree with you. Let's go ahead and, let's go, ahead and go through it, though. <laughs> the, okay. <laughs> so Ashram was a Canaanite fertility goddess, um, the, the counterpart to Baal, all right? And, and so um, the thought is that Jezebel, King Ahab's wife, obviously started the whole thing with Baal worshippers and at the same time probably brought in the whole concept of ashram also, Baal's, Baal's counterpart. So the worship of ashram involved all kinds of sexual immorality. I mean, t temple prostitution, that was a part of the worship process. It, it just, you know, you can't imagine how twisted the worship was. Now, the reference that we always see in scripture is Asherah poles. And so you picture these stone poles with insignias on them that are about this, this wide and really tall. That's the Asherah poles. And that's what they were bowing before and doing all kinds of activities in worship. Um, Manasseh, Manasseh had he was strongly condemned for his uh, his uh, worship of ashram. So from these early examples, it's interesting. Do we still have ashram poles around? Do we have ashram poles here today? No, but the whole sexual immorality thing, boy, that's still something that is really worshipped, isn't it? Um, you can see how that pulled the people of Israel away from God, that... It was just something that was attractive that, oh, okay, I like this worship a whole lot better than what I'm having to do to, to the Israel God. I'm going to go worship Asherah. We could still see that mindset today, even though there's no physical Asherah poles. It's like the spirit of that is still alive and well today. Um, but what does this passage tell us will happen as a result of this judgment? Which is what, Sue? Okay, so Sue's saying, when I, when I ask the question, what's going to happen? Sue's saying exactly what God would want to happen. They're going to turn from their idols and turn to him. And sometimes, he, you know, we always, we always hope that you can use a soft noodle to get people's attention, but sometimes it takes a really hard stick. And we're seeing some hard sticks being, being used here. But the stick is working. What God's really wanting is for people to turn back to him. Uh, any other thoughts on verses 7 and 8? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sue's, always, Sue's always got ways for us to remember. She says the ashram is Baal's babe, which will help you. F none of us will ever forget now what, that, <laughs> what the counterpart is. So, all right. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's go on to slide number nine, which is looking at verses nine through 11. It says, in that day, same time period, their strong cities will be like forsaken places in the forest or like branches they abandon before the sons of Israel and the land will be a desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, you plant delightful plants and set them with vine slips of a strange God. In the day that you plant it, you carefully fence it in, and in the morning you bring your seed to blossom, but the harvest will be a heap and a day of sickling and incurable pain. Oh, so what's this passage telling us? Isaiah's kind of flowery, isn't he? He's kind of poetic. And I'm not a real poetic person, so I have to read and reread this. I don't know about you guys, but I just like, I read it and I go, what? You know, what is it that this is telling us? As a result of this judgment in this day, what's happening? The strong cities are going to be abandoned, and thickets and underbrush is going to grow, okay? And because of their 
unfaithfulness to the true God and having forgotten him, their efforts of, of planting vines, which means grapes, right? Um, and, and getting a harvest is going to be fruitless, not fruitful. They're not, they're, they're going to see that God's not blessing them. He's not blessing their harvest. Their plants are going to be diseased. People are going to be in pain. They're just, they're not going to be doing well. And they're going to know. They're going to know. And they had turned from God who could save them and depended on these idols, which we still see today, right? Um, and they're relying on their own strength. They think they can survive by planting their vines and building their cities by their own strength. But we can take a lesson from this for ourselves, can't we? It's, we're still facing the same idols. We're still facing the same thing. There might not be wooden poles, but we still have the same temptation to pull away from God, worship something else, trust in our own strength, and then when it doesn't work, when all else fails, Okay, then, then I'm going to go. Then I'm going to turn to God. People haven't changed. We're the same people as these people are here, right? So who is this passage about? Fred, who's it talking about? Not sure. I changed my mind as far as what I said about Okay, Why? Okay. Which is um, Jacob's blessing to the twelve sons. And if you read the blessing of Joseph, it's very similar to what this is in. Okay. Northern. Okay. I'm not going to repeat everything Fred just said, but he just gave an explanation going back to Genesis of why he thinks the the glory of Jacob is referring to the Northern Kingdom. And I agree with him. I had looked it up too and I thought, okay, Northern Kingdom, but I didn't have it in my notes of why I, I uh, thought of the Northern Kingdom. It's still a little fuzzy, but I still lean towards the Northern Kingdom. Now here's the thing. When we say, who is this passage about in verses 9 through 11, it's a little tough to figure out. Um, so what I had to do, normally I have precept upon precept study guides, and I don't. So I took Isaiah 17, and I took it and double-spaced it. And in precept upon precept studies, I don't know if you guys can see that closely there. Uh, <laughs> this is, it's just called an observation worksheet, when you just take a chapter and you just double-space it. And then I just use my markers to go through and mark all the people with different colors. And when you go through and you do this, you can tell, okay, if you, which I agree with Fred, that 7 and 8 is talking about northern Israel. Well, then as you go down and you see that 7 and 8 is talking about northern Israel, then it follows that 9 through 11 is talking about the same. But you have to, I couldn't figure it out until I, I, I had to do my markings to be able to go through, and then like, okay, there's the use. They followed through. I was able to, I was able to figure that out. But that's just a little tool. Ask me about that. It's super easy. If you want to uh, learn about that, to try to figure, to figure it out. So I leaned that way anyway. Uh, since the previous passage is Israel, then verse nine starts with their strong cities. So then it would have to, it would have to continue on. That's still talking about Israel. Um, so then, anything else on that before we go on to verses 12 through 14? Isaiah is a prophet to Judah. Mm -hmm. and, and oh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, so he's specifically a prophet to the southern kingdom. 
But in this, he's talking about the northern kingdom. But if we go through and we look at Isaiah, he's constantly prophesizing about what's going to happen to other places and other nations. So, you know, it could be talking about Tyre or so, you know, it just, he prophesizes about all kinds of stuff. So, which is, which is good to, so we do have to kind of go through and figure out what in the world is he pointing to now? Because you just never know with this guy. <laughs> all right. Verses 12 through 14, slide 10. Um, now, notice, before we jump into that, if you go through, if you go back and read through this, you can see that verses 4 through um, four through 11, it's a continuous thought, you and then and then and then, okay? You can see it's all at the same time frame, all the way from verse 1 down through verse 11, Notice the shift here in verse 12. Alas, the uproar of many peoples who roar like the roaring of the seas and the rumbling of nations, who rush on like the rumbling of mighty waters. The nations rumble on like the rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away and be chased like the chaff in the mountains before the wind or like whirling dust before a gale. At evening time... Behold, there is terror. Before morning, they are no more. Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. So th th there's a shift there. Notice this time, instead of saying you, it's saying us. And it starts with the last. So what do, what do we see happening here? I believe this passage has already happened. Remember last week when we talked about the law of double references and we talked about, we were remembering Daniel 11, where we looked at Daniel 11. Part of Daniel 11 is talking about Antiochus, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, but then there was a piece of Daniel 11 that had not happened yet, and it was talking about the future Antichrist. And it was kind of hard to tell because it appeared all in one chapter, but part of it was talking about something that was a near prophecy, a near event, and then the other thing was talking about something that's way off and still hasn't happened yet today. I think that's the same thing here. Part of it is talking about an event that hasn't happened yet, and then the other part, verses 12 through 14, is talking about something that now in our time has already happened. As a matter of fact, you can read ahead to Isaiah 37, and it matches what happened to Judah. So if you go and you read um, what happened when the Assyrian army started coming against Judah and they started taking out some of the towns of Judah and at that time instead of um, Pilger, what's his name, uh, Pilger, I always have to look at it. The other guy, what's his name, someone help me. Uh, oh, I forgot his name. The other guy, the other, <laughs> the other king that I have to read it carefully to get it. That's not who it is now. Now it's some and I can't say this one well either, Sennacherib, Sennacherib, say it again, Sennacherib, okay, Wait. I've heard it different ways, and so I didn't, I normally write down my little phonetic spelling so I can say it real good, and I don't have that here, anyway, 701, 700 BC, he comes, and he's sieges, he besieges Jerusalem, and he's going to attack it, but Hezekiah and Isaiah pray, and so they're in terror the night before. And then the next morning, they're gone. The Assyrians had, had just taken off. They were no more. Well, the angel of the Lord came and destroyed like 185,000 of them. But the rest were chased away. So they didn't take, they didn't take Jerusalem. And so when we know that history, and we look at that again at verse 14, at evening time, behold, there's terror. Before morning there are no more. Such will be the portion of those who plunder us and the lot of those who pillage us. Well, then you read ahead to Isaiah 37 and you see, okay, this is a near prophecy. This part has already been fulfilled. But that's something really important for us to learn, and I never knew about this until I was listening to a pastor that was explaining it, the law of double reference that really helped me understand Daniel 11. And so... It helps me understand these. Jewish thought 
is not chronological and that drives me crazy. I want one chapter to be talking about one time period or I want you to at least say, now in another time, it's instead they just block it all together and there's very few hints of when it changes. That's also something we should keep in mind with Ezekiel. Remember with Ezekiel, with the Gog Magog War, we said, okay, that Israel's got to be feeling safe but then the very last part of Ezekiel 39, we saw that it said that I will not hide my face from them any longer. Well, that doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation when Jesus returns. But a bunch of people are saying, okay, well, but it could happen, the, the war could start now. Well, that's a problem because it can't, you know, it's not until the end would that, would that time frame work. It would if there's a law of double reference in there that I just, I'm not seeing and that in its two different time frames, that's how it could work. That's how it works here. So it's a good thing to note that law of double reference. It's common in uh, the Jewish writings. And I think I just blew through that whole thing. What do you do? You guys have any other thoughts on verses twelve through fourteen? Hmm. Because, okay, and here's, I, I thought of the same thing, Sue, um, except, notice it says in verse 13, the nations rumble on, and, and the fact that it's nations, that's where I started thinking Gog may Gog, uh, the nations rumble on like rumbling of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away. Does that happen with Gog may Gog? They get wiped out. They're toast, right? God wipes them. Uh, having, having trouble remembering now, but God just wipes them out. There's bodies laying all over the place. So, so what? They have to bury all the bodies. Purifying the land, right. So the part where they're fleeing and they're all chasing them away, that part didn't sound like Gog may Gog to me. But I thought the same thing, but I think, you know, this really matches. Could be, but it also matches exactly what happened with Sennacherib and that, that dude. Go, <laughs> go, go look up, <laughs> look up Sennacherib. <laughs> I can spell it for you, but <laughs> that, that, that 701, 700 BC time frame where, Assyri where the Assyrians um, sieged Jerusalem. And uh, so very interesting. So what do we get out of this? What's the, go into application. What's our key point? You know, I mean, this is, why are we in the middle of Isaiah just grabbing this chapter out? Well, the key point is this is going to happen to Israel because of what verse 10 says, uh, it, it, it's going to happen at the same time it happens to Damascus. And the whole reason is they forget the God of their salvation. That's a, that's a key point for me. I want to make sure I'm not forgetting the God of my salvation. I've got to make sure that everything I do is for him. Everything I do, I'm listening to him. And uh, I have to recognize his voice. I have to know when it's him. And for me, it's really easy because he's normally pushing me. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I'm like, oh, that must be you, God, because I don't want to think about this. I want to do something else. And this does glorify you. I don't have time. I don't want to do this. I know it's him. I just need to listen to that voice. When I can identify it's God, I've got to make sure I'm not fighting it. And I've got to make sure I understand when he's leading me. But this has key ramifications for us today. It tells us why we want to be paying attention to Damascus and related to Damascus, northern Israel. I'll tell you who I think of. One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite teachers that I follow, that I think I have a bunch of you guys following too, is Amir Sarfati. I love Amir Sarfati. Guess where Amir Sarfati lives? Northern Israel northern Israel, right in the wake of where everything is going to happen. So he obviously thinks that Jesus is going to come beforehand. He's, he is pre-trib and putting his money where his mouth is on it. But what about this? I want to know what Amir Sarfati thinks about this. I mean, I'm sure he's got his opinion, but I want to hear what his opinion is on Isaiah 17. 
So do you see why this is important for us to grab right now before we go, before we go on? We're going to have another little one just like this with Psalm 83. But given what, uh, I'm going to go ahead and put this map back up, or this time frame back up in case anybody wants to take a picture of that, even though I said I'd send it out. What's your application? Ah. So Sue says she needs to put a, pay attention to idols, anything that she's putting ahead of God. Yeah. Great point. There's another point for me here. Another point for me is that people tend to think that end times prophecy is just revelation. And that, you know, you can just ignore revelation. Uh, Crystal, I don't know if Crystal's on Zoom right now, but I was talking to... Is she on? Are you on here, Crystal? Huh? Yes, I am. Yes. Crystal, tell me, tell uh, tell people what you told me this morning about the Bible study you were in and what was said. I was in a Bible study on First Peter. We were in the third chapter, verses fourteen through twenty-two, and we got talking about um, the thousand-year reign. And the leader um, obviously was uncomfortable, and she just basically said that we don't need to waste our time on Revelation. Don't need to so. waste your time on Revelation. And Crystal started to jump in, so she said someone else jumped in. But, but I texted her back this morning and said, I would have liked to ask, what about the other books of End Times Prophecy? If we shouldn't waste our time with Revelation, then I guess we shouldn't waste our time with Daniel and First and Second Thessalonians and Isaiah 17 and Psalm 83 and Joel and Zechariah. Because guess what? That's all end times prophecy. And that's not all. We've also got a, a chunk in each of the Gospels that's end times prophecy. It is Jesus' teaching. But hey, it's end times prophecy. So we shouldn't waste our time with that either. Yeah, if it's not important, then why is a quarter of the Bible prophecy and half of that not fulfilled yet? And why did Jesus say, I'm giving you this so that because it's about to take place? This, I'm, giving, I'm telling you the things that's coming that's about to take place. And then he said, stay alert, be ready. Oh, maybe staying alert and being ready is studying this stuff so that when we see these events happening, we can go, oh, okay, well, that matches what they said here, which means this is coming, and then we can go out and share with others and help them prepare and hopefully have something to say, and this is why you need to come to Jesus, right? So, boy, I'd like to talk to that lady. <laughs> Chris, I want to have a conversation with that lady. <laughs> I hope something that you're getting out of this is the importance of studying end times prophecy. And end times prophecy is not just revelation. End times prophecy is also Daniel. It, what, I was talking to um, one of my other daughters who was saying, Mom, guess what? We're going to study Daniel, but we're not going to study the prophecy part. Like, what part of Daniel are you going to be studying then? What, I mean, what, chapter 1? Because you get to chapter 2, and guess what? It's prophecy. And it goes all the way to chapter 12. It's prophecy. You know, First and Second Thessalonians, Joel, Zechariah, the Gospels. God's told us prophecy from Genesis to Revelation. It's sprinkled through all the books, and it's sprinkled there for a reason, because out of his love for us, he's telling us what we need to know about what's to come, so that when we see these events happening, we can recognize it, and we can be prepared. We can look up, because our redemption is drawing near. I, I, I don't know what to do with anyone that says we don't need to worry about prophecy, about the... I, I, I don't know how to... That got me. <laughs> I know Crystal was upset. I was upset with her. And I'm not even in that study. But I hope that's something you guys get. It doesn't matter if it's a little piece of Isaiah 17 or a little piece of Psalm 83. We're not going to get the whole picture from Revelation, guys. We're not going to just be able to do Revelation and be done and then understand what's going on. We need the whole 
We need all of what Scripture says about it. So that's why we're doing this. That's why we're doing it. Someone else, get me off my soapbox. Someone else, what's your application? Sue said that Jesus said he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He's talking about he's talking about the whole thing. He's talking about the whole thing from beginning to end. Absolutely. It's all God's word. <laughs> How can we take out sections and say, this part, you don't need to study this part? Guys, that's false teaching. If you've got somebody who's saying this part of scripture you don't need to waste your time with, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's a big problem. Someone else. Okay. Paula says prophecy gives, gives us hope. God, we, and yes, the whole Old Testament is they turn from God, they realize their sin, they, they cry out to God, God forgives them, restores them, they turn... And there's hope for us when we see that Israel constantly messes up, but when they repent, God restores them. That's tremendously re, uh, encouraging to me because I keep messing up. I need God to keep forgiving me. So I'm so glad. Someone else, Fred, you were going to say something. Back to <laughs> of course. Well, are we going back to the first part of it or? <laughs> So you're saying a dual fulfillment of prophecy. Could, it sounds very similar to Revelation 12 with the dragon spewing water out of his mouth. And the woman being swept away by or not swept away, but taken into the desert. Ah. Okay. So Fred's seeing potential dual fulfillment in verses 12 through 14, comparing it to Revelation 12. Um yeah, I mean, maybe so. Maybe it is dual fulfillment. I just kind of stopped when I realized it had so clearly was so clearly fulfilled with Sennacherib, Sennacherib that guy. <laughs> I can't say his name well. There's a few words now and then I really can't, just cannot say. Um, so, yeah, maybe so. But that, that's, that's an interesting thought. So maybe it is future, but we for sure know that it was a, a definite fulfillment of that uh, of the the uh, Assyrian king that came in 701 to 700 BC time frame. Good point. Someone else. What's your application? Crystal? Do you have a question? No, I have an application. Good. Um, What's your application? <laughs> so, all the scriptures we, and forgive me if you've said this, I'm still having trouble hearing, but um, throughout the scriptures, Israel forgot God. They, he, they didn't put God first. And so the application that I have is that we must always keep God in our hearts and our minds. I mean, always. And we need to speak the name of Jesus daily. But in the conversation that I had with you this morning, it brought to mind that I need to know what I believe. I, I learn it from studying from you and from other places, but it needs to be me. And it can't be someone in my Bible study class telling you to forget it. Um, and I've just realized how important it is that, that I have to continue to study because it has to right in my mind. I can't just say Jan says, or I'm not sure I'm being clear, but... Oh, so um, let, me, let me just expand on that a little bit. Um, and one of my greatest teachers will be here in a few weeks, Debbie Blank, right? I, I'm not going to be able to stand before Jesus and go, but Debbie said, <laughs> no, you, you, whoever, you, whatever teachers we have, you know, Brian said, so and so, we can't do that. We've, we've got, we can, we have to take the teaching and we've got to see it in scripture for ourselves before we hang our hat on it, before we say, yes, this makes sense. And so then that also says, whenever we're sharing with someone else, 
we've got to say, I believe this because Scripture says this. And, you know, this, what we're doing on Sunday morning right now in the other room over there, Revelation, it's my third time to teach Revelation. And gosh, I don't know. Um, uh, it's at least my fifth time through studying it, maybe sixth time. It's taken me that long to get this to where I feel like I'm, I've got to where I can really talk about it. But uh, it wasn't until this last time when we did it in 2019 that I felt like, okay, I can say for sure it's pre-trib because I can point to these verses. Previous to that, I couldn't say that. Now, I can still be wrong, but I know I'm accountable for what I teach. So I want to make sure anything I'm teaching, I'm always clearly saying, I can't say this because it's unclear. I, there's not enough information for me able to tell you that. But when I can say, oh, look at all this scripture, that's clear, then I can, then I can share it. And I agree totally with what Crystal is saying. We've got to take any teaching, we've got to compare it to scripture, and it's got to be clear for us in scripture before we can, before we can believe it or share it with someone else. We can never say so-and-so says, unless it's Jesus. Unless the so-and-so is Jesus, we can't, we can't share it. Excellent. Good application. So glad you're on Zoom, Crystal. We get to see, we get to actually hear you. Someone else? Anybody else? Paula says the application and takeaway that all scriptures were the study and debate and study. Isaiah 17 has highlighted the differences and opinions on whether this is past or future. Reminds me back to the statement that all of Israel will feel secure. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So Paul is going back to. Um, the, the statement that all of Israel will feel secure. Yeah, she's, she's going through looking this. Paul has probably a better understanding of a lot of this than, than uh, some of us because of everywhere she's been as a pilot. Um, she can picture some of these areas at least much better than I can. I can't speak for the, the rest of us, but with her, she has a better understanding of geography than I do. I can tell you that. Um, so looking at our calendar, or remember, I've got the big word tentative up there, but one thing that is not tentative is next week. We have worship night next week. For those of you who are just watching us online, uh, it will be online on our Redeemer Facebook page, our worship uh, starting at, I think it's 5.30 is food, and 7 o'clock is the worship night. Um, and it's going to be awesome. I hope those of you who are here can come in person because it will be so uplifting and encouraging. And then the following week, April 7th, grab your, your bag of food and come at 7. And we're, I just, we're going to really kind of go through and figure out this whole prophecy thing, talk about it. I want that to be a night where you're getting excited about it. Um, those of you who are on Zoom right now, we will Zoom you in. Uh, let me know. If you want to be a part of that planning and just talking about it, and we'll Zoom you in, and you can sit with us as we talk about it. And if no one's interested online, then we're just going to do it here in person. Um, and then uh, we're going to have uh, April 21st, another preparedness. If I can get some of this done and we can actually push up the Psalm 83, we will. Just plan on being here, and then you're not going to miss anything. Okay? So 757, let's go ahead and pray and let's... Fred's thought of another verse he wants to talk about. <laughs> okay. Lord, thank you for uh, putting it on our hearts to study all of your word and to seek, um, seek truth only in your word and to understand that you are our source of truth, not any teacher or commentary or podcast or video no matter how good it sounds, how good it looks, we've got to make sure we're comparing scripture with whatever we're being taught to find truth. Lord, we also know that your Holy Spirit is going to reveal that truth to us as we do that. You're also going to reveal falsehood to us. It's not going to sound right, and it's not going to match your word. Uh, Lord, please protect us in this day of deception and delusion that's getting stronger and stronger. Please keep us in your word. 
Um, let us be diligent to spend time with you daily in prayer and in your word so that we are prepared for what's to come and able to share it with others. Lord, we just thank you for this study and we look forward to um, the additional learning and opportunities. And Lord, I just pray ahead of time, I pray for our worship night coming up next week that we have great attendance because I want a bunch of people to be encouraged. And Lord, I pray for April 5th for this prophecy night that you are just telling us to do. Lord, please let everything we do about it glorify you. Um, Lord, I pray for, for people to be able to invite people that have questions about prophecy, for them to get their questions answered and, and let it light a fire in souls to study your word, study your prophecy, to learn about you, to trust in you, Lord and to prepare and to share. That's what we want to be about. So, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunities you're giving us. Pray that we just are continually glorifying and lifting you up and uh, learning how to live out everything that you're giving us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. See you next week, 6.30. Um, we will just meet in the other room next week, okay? All right. I'm sorry. I'm already focused on the next one, right? Worship night here, and then the following week, April 7th, we'll meet in the other room. You could, I'm just totally focused on this prophecy night. It's crazy. All right. Thank you, everybody.